Hey friend, welcome back to Identifying Cloud Networking Concepts. Now that we've talked about some of the connectivity mechanisms and mediums, and even talked about software-defined networking and how that helps administer cloud networks, it's time to think a little bit more about some redundancy and performance aspects. Really, things that continue to drive not the underlying connection, but rather the quality of the connection. Mwah, chef kiss. <laughs> because not only do we want to be able to get there and back, but we want to be able to do it at the right level and quality of service. Keeping in mind that nobody wants to have a bad experience, but for a lot of us, if a web page is down, or if there's too many people in line, or if our car breaks down in the morning, it leads to a bad experience. And as a service provider, you may have customers that you care about the experience of, and as a customer, cloud service providers care about your experience as well. So in this lesson, let's talk about an important principle called load balancing. <laughs> and indeed, the idea that it can provide failover and distribution, two key principles in the load balancing world. So kind of digging on into it, when we first talk about uh, the first part of it here, failover. Failover implies that we are looking for a scenario in which we can protect against the loss of a specific system in the background. Now, in some of the diagrams that you might've seen me drawing earlier on, like when I was drawing my local area network here, okay, you heard me mention the idea of a gateway and the gateway might lead us to the internet. You know, that's a happy little path. There I go off to the internet, YouTube videos, here I come. Um, the problem is though, that might be a single piece of infrastructure in your environment. And so if that resource dies, goes down, or maybe the path to it is lost, we now have no connectivity and we're concerned about how we could restore that or how we could bring things back online. And so load balancing offers us a potential opportunity to have more than one device providing that functionality. So if we had a separate gateway right here with potentially a separate connection to the internet, we would be able to redirect traffic over to that other gateway. Now therein lies some of the trickiness here. When we think about how TCP IP networking works, typically you're talking about a client over here sending traffic to some sort of a destination. And we could say a server here. <laughs> it would also work to say your source and your destination. But in each one of those scenarios, typically we're talking about using uh, an IP address to make that happen. So the source has an IP and the destination has an IP address. Now this is where things get a little tricky for us. If this gateway is IP1 and this gateway is IP2, how are we going to tell the source which IP address they're supposed to use? And there's a lot of different mechanisms for how this can be done in modern networks out there. So we just wanna focus on the basic idea of load balancing, being able to fail over between them or distribute traffic between them. So one really common pattern would be the idea of using something like a virtual IP address. And so instead of targeting one of the gateways directly, we would build some sort of a proxy in between that has its own IP address on it, and we would send our destination traffic to that IP. Then in the background, this device, the load balancer, could then forward the requests to what other systems we need it to be sent to. And the clients, the people sending those requests, they don't need to know specifically which gateway is being used. Now, I'm trying to be generic here, friends. Keep in mind that the pattern is more important here than the specifics. Load balancing can be done across networking devices, it can be done across servers, and it can also be done across pads as well, if you've got different networking connections. The basic principle though, is target a single destination and then allow that load balancer to distribute traffic in the background. So that kind of builds the basic principle behind failover. The other idea that you heard me talking about was distribution. And in order to really kind of understand uh, what we care about here, we wanna understand a little bit more about how we handle capacity. So let's imagine for a minute that your client over here is sending traffic to a server, all right? Now that server can handle one connection, it can handle 20 connections, maybe it can handle 2000 connections. The point is eventually the server runs out of resources. All right, so let's just kind of say for a minute that we have a system over here, okay? And this has uh, four gigs of RAM on it, Okay, and maybe it has two CPUs. Okay, so eventually it's gonna be exhausted and there's only so much traffic that we could send at it. When we try to grow this system, there are two different kind of mechanisms available. One of the first ideas would be that if we want it to be three times larger and handle more traffic, we could give that system three times more power. Okay, so we give it six CPUs and we give it 12 gigs of RAM. And theoretically it can handle three times the amount of traffic. The only problem with this, and we call this vertical scaling, it's where you grow the size of the individual system, uh, is that you still only have one single system there. 
And so even though it's more powerful, if that system fails, you still only have the one and therefore you're going to need some other system like in this failover model that we were talking about. So the alternative to vertical scaling, which is where we add more compute power, would be something like horizontal scaling. So let me write this on here. This is our vertical scaling. Okay. And then if we are looking at horizontal scaling, same scenario, you want it to handle three times as much traffic, then we would build three systems with the same amount of power on them. Okay, and that can go off the screen. Four and two, four and two, four and two. And now we have three systems to handle the work. The theory being that three systems can handle three times as much work. But we're now back in that same problem that we had before, where we have three different destinations and no way to tell our clients what to use. And da -da 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 -da, <laughs> this is where our load balancer comes into play. The load balancer can then live out front, and that is where we direct all of our requests to. And in the background, the load balancer can distribute that traffic to the client systems and servers in the background that are receiving those requests. And the beautiful thing is, again, that our clients, the pokes that are sending it, the source origination points, they don't need to know how many or any of the other specifics about the systems in the background. And so two different principles here for load balancers. The idea that we can handle failovers by abstracting and pulling ourselves away from the underlying systems and providing a single entry point. And the idea that we can then handle traffic distribution across a wide array of nodes and systems in the background. One of the final things to kind of consider here too is that if you're looking at a situation in which you are doing traffic distribution, okay, you also have a concern of the health of the systems that you're using in the background. And so a lot of modern load balancing systems will use some sort of a health check. This would be like a little, hello, are you awake? Are you still responding? Uh, are you able to handle web traffic requests? Typically, these are going to be directed at something that's like an application port. Okay, and I know we're getting a little deep here. We'll talk about ports and traffic a little bit more later on, but it might be port 80 for web traffic or port 443 for SSL traffic. The point is we can then contact those systems and say, hey, are you available? Are you available? Are you available? And as long as they're still available, we keep sending traffic to them, okay? Now, if something goes wrong, I know, heaven forbid something go wrong, <laughs> and one of these systems go down, it will stop responding to the health checks, okay? And the load balancer can see, oh, we got a bad problem over here. Let's stop sending traffic to that particular node. And in this way, then, we are no longer uh, sending bad requests, bad connections that are experienced by our users on the far side. So a lot of principles kind of coming together here, friends. And just to kind of recap, as we talk about the idea of load balancing, we recognize that it's an important mechanism for providing failover and abstraction for our environment. By putting the load balancer out as the entry point, we can hide the resources that live behind it. The clients sending the requests or originating the traffic, they don't need to know about all of the other systems in the background. It's a very important principle, especially when you consider too that now those other systems uh, if it's an actual web server, they don't have to live directly on the internet. So if there are malicious users, black hat, um, or some sort of threat agent out there that's attacking those servers, we can use that load balancer as a shield, <laughs> put that thing up there, <laughs> and it gives us a chance to potentially mitigate those attacks before they reach the servers themselves. One of the last principles you heard me saying was that beyond failover, load balancers are an important part of being able to handle scaling and traffic distribution. So if you use a horizontal scaling model where you're building more instances or more virtual machines or more servers or more containers in the background, <laughs> then that load balancer provides a way of directing traffic to them and making effective use of them. <laughs> Think about the last time you might've seen some group of workers standing around. There's one guy digging a hole with a shovel and everybody else is watching. <laughs> we want to avoid that. Load balancers can help us with it. The last piece you heard me describing there too is the use of a health check. This ensures that not only are we distributing traffic, but we're doing it intelligently, which is always a big win. Ding, <laughs> light bulb. And this means that we're checking the health of the instances, nodes, or containers, or services to make sure that they're up and viable so that if they go down, we stop sending requests to them. And in the end, all of this is about improving the connectivity and the experience and the quality of the delivery of these services for our end users or our customers or our other business divisions. So as we move forward, friends, we'll be digging into another important networking service, the domain name system, which also has some cool load balancing tricks in it as well. And all of these work together to provide the right level of connectivity, robustness, and configurability for modern cloud-based networks. So stick with me, friends, and I'll see you there.